All right, here we are once more. We're in the second and what should be the final part of the chapter some call five. All right. And if we have time, we'll probably try to do the foreword. And we're in the book By What Standard? An Analysis of the Thought of Cornelius Van Til by R.J. Rush Dooney. So let's hit the record button. Man's growth in self-realization is, we have seen, his growth also in spontaneity and freedom. Mm, not too so happy with that. Spontaneity and freedom. Man's growth in self-realization is, we have seen, his growth also in spontaneity and freedom. Van Til makes very clear the full significance of this spontaneity. In God, there is no difference between potentiality and act. That is, God is fully and perfectly self-conscious without any unconscious instincts and drives. Man, as a temporal being, cannot be entirely self-conscious as God is self-conscious, not pure act or God is pure act. Okay. I didn't quite get the meaning of the last bit there. Nor pure act, as God is pure act. Before the fall, however, man's will controlled his subconscious life, while after the fall, man's subconscious life controlled his will. This is not a metaphysical, but a moral change. Fallen man is a slave to his subconscious rather than master of it. But, as regenerate man grows in self-realization, he grows first in his control of his subconscious, in the spontaneity of his reactions, and in his self-consciousness. Second, there is not only increase in the swiftness of his spontaneity, but also an increase in stability. Third, parallel to this is a growth of momentum in doing the will of God. Not only is it man's task to seek the kingdom of God, but also the task of society as a whole, an ideal and task set before man in paradise. The covenant responsibility makes it clear that the self-realization of the individual is the advantage of all and is furthered by and depended upon the realization of others. The pagan conception of self-realization involves the sacrifice of others, and is at their expense. The Christian conception of self-realization is in terms of the kingdom of God and a common humanity, an organism. The conception of the church as a body stresses the fact that individuality is not monotonous repetition. We are not all identical organs, eyes or ears, but each a separate individual and yet part of a common whole. We serve that whole by developing our own individuality, which thereby develops the whole and enables others to develop their own individualities. Health and prosperity are legitimate parts of this ideal. The Christian ethics is not ascetic, nor is, as Van Til emphasises, the body to be regarded as ethically lower than the soul. Quote, a sound mind in a sound body is a true kingdom goal. End quote. It is paganism to hold evil as inherent in matter. Self-realization is productive of happiness. In that quote, a realized self is a happy self. End quote. And at the same time, quote, only a happy self is a completely realized self. End quote. Even as bodily exercise leads to health, so growth in righteousness creates a growth in happiness. Uh, I, I didn't turn the fan on when I first came in and uh, feeling there was... Whoa. In the kingdom of God, there is no disharmony between that which is righteous, that which is useful, and that which makes for happiness. When we turn to non-Christian thought, we find that all the various systems have in common a conception of existence as it is today as being normal. There is a denial of the biblical concept of original righteousness, of created character. Hang on, I hit my tie there. 
Hit my tie. There is a denial of the biblical concepts of original righteousness, of created character and of the fall. There is a denial also of any ethical ideal given by a self-sufficient God, by means of which all systems of ethics must be judged. Behind this denial lies a radical hostility to God. According to Van Til, quote, The real meaning of this opposition to the original perfect ethical ideal is nothing short of hatred of the living God. If God does exist as man's creator, we have seen it is impossible that evil should be inherent in the temporal universe. If God exists, man himself must have brought in sin by an act of willful transgression. Hence, existence, as it is now, is not normal, but abnormal. Accordingly, to maintain that existence as it is now is normal is tantamount to a denial of man's responsibility for sin and this in turn makes God responsible for sin. This simply means that there is no absolute God. Sorry. I was um, not epistemically and this simply means that there is no absolute God. For the Christian, however, man is today, quote, a broken personality, end quote, in that the various aspects of his being are no longer in right relationship one to another because he is not in right relationship to God. He may, for example, be given to a one-sided intellectualism or to a one-sided voluntarism. In any in it, in any and all such cases, the one-sidedness is a consequence of sin. Quote, Man was created in perfect harmony with himself because he was created in perfect harmony with God. Hence, Christian ethics can never be one-sidedly intellectualistic or one-sidedly voluntaristic. We do not say that, as Christians, we are not often one-sided. As a matter of fact, no one escapes being one-sided to some extent. But we confess that this one-sidedness is sin before God, and we hold that harmony between the various aspects of human personality can be obtained on no other than the Christian basis End quote. Basic to Christian faith is, first, the assumption that man was created as a whole personality and that man can again become a whole personality only through Christian faith and maturity. Second, another basic presupposition is the doctrine of creation, whereby mankind is a common whole and bound by a common ethical ideal as given by the Creator. All non-Christian thought in denying the doctrine of creation denies itself thereby a universalism of meaning and a unity of interpretation. Third, it follows, therefore, that men in all places and ages must be thought of as a family, and ethics cannot be, as non-Christian ethics is, individualistic. Individualistic ethics falls between two extremes. It sacrifices, as in Plato, most individuals to a small number deemed worthy of the sacrifice, without any organic conception of the nation or the race. Statism is, as Van Til clearly sees, individualism of the worst sort. The mass of humanity is regarded as manure for the welfare of the ruling class. Modern individualistic ethics often goes to the other extreme and regards society as an aggregate of individuals and dissipates all authority. When the right of the individual as against the right of society is emphasised, authority disappears. In Van Til's words, quote, Consequently, there is no proper sense of the necessity of authority. Authority has largely disappeared from the family. The autocracy of the father, as it often existed in the perverted individual... <laughs> uh-huh. 
The autocracy of the father, as it often existed in the perverted individualism of old, has been replaced by the autocracy of the child in the perverted individualism of today. The autocracy of the king, which did not recognize the rights of the subjects, has been replaced with a false democracy, which seeks the ultimate source of authority in the multitude of men without recognition of God. End quote. Non-Christian thought, lacking the biblical concept of creation and original righteousness, assumes a natural conflict between society and the individual. It assumes that the individual cannot develop except at the expense of other individuals and society, and vice versa, that society cannot develop except at the expense of the individual. Thus, life becomes a warfare, and ethics becomes either individualistic or compromising. Aristotle's answer was the doctrine of the mean, of the middle of the ruder as the virtuous man. This is virtually a denial of the ideal of moral perfection and assumes that virtue is merely keeping a balance between the two evils. Keeping a balance between two evils. The Christian, on the other hand, is, in virtue of his justification and regeneration, in principle perfect, though not in this life in degree perfect. The principle of his life is the perfection of Jesus Christ, not the negative effort of keeping balance between evils. The absolute ideal is maintained throughout Scripture, although the absolute summum bonum will never be reached on earth. The original righteousness of man and his creation in the image of God make it reasonable to expect that the absolute ideal will be gained and is the proper goal of historical activity. The biblical promise is that complete happiness will come to the perfect, whereas the penalty for disobedience is death. The goal of history is thus perfection, and its realization, the kingdom of God, is portrayed in Revelation as paradise regained, a life in which natural and moral evil are destroyed. Natural and moral evil are closely allied in Scripture, not in pagan terms as resulting one from the other. Natural evil is as... Natural evil, as a result of moral evil, but rather both alike a result of the fall and man's alienation from God. With the regenerate, the kingdom of God is not only an objective and a hope, but a present possession as a gift of God. The perfection they strive for is theirs in principle now, by virtue of the substitutionary role of Jesus Christ. Thus, as John states, the Christian in principle cannot sin, although he is in degree a sinner and cannot deny his sin without being a liar. Thus, while man must strive for the kingdom, he must also recognize that it is the gift of God and his very striving an act and manifestation of grace. Not only is man's task the positive one of asserting and extending the dominion rights of the kingdom, but also the negative one of destroying the works of the evil one. As Van Til states it, the regenerate see evil as an insult to God. Not only must evil be destroyed everywhere, but its consequences also, while, on the other hand, there is the positive requirement to do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. Evil must be destroyed in the world at large and in ourselves, and God is ready to use the heathen as a scourge against his own in order to cleanse him. So seriously does he regard evil in his people, so seriously does he regard evil in his people. The Christian must not surrender to the pessimism of unbelieving quote-unquote realism or to the shallow optimism of uncomprehending perfectionism. Quote, 
A particular point is that of the Christian's attitude toward the abolition of war. Some would hold that since the Bible tells us that there will be wars till the end of time, it would be flying in the face of providence if we should try to outlaw war. But there is a difference between a commandment of God and a statement of what will come to pass. God commands us to be perfect, but tells us that none of us will ever be perfect in life. <coughs> hmm. I want to fiddle with the drive and stuff here. I know I shouldn't. I'm going to turn it down a notch. <clears throat> God commands us to be perfect, but tells us that none of us will ever be perfect in this life. So it is our plain task to do what we can in legitimate ways to lessen the number of wars and to make them less gruesome. A great deal of time will have to be taken up with the destruction of evil. We may not even seem to see much progress in ourselves or round about us during our lifetime. We shall have to build with a trowel in one hand and with a sword. I'm breathless. I don't know why I'm breathless. Why am I breathless? Give me the air. Give me the air. I want the air. Give me the air. Gonna have to rethink this ventilation. Hello, but true. Hello, too. Hello, but where am I? Where was I? Where am I? <clears throat> we shall have to build with the trowel in one hand and the sword in the other. It may seem to us to be a hopeless task of sweeping the ocean dry, yet we know that this is exactly what our ethical ideal would be if we were not Christians. We know that for non-Christians, their ethical ideal can never be realised either for themselves or for society. They do not even know the true ethical ideal. And as to our efforts, we know that though much of our time may have to be taken up with pumping out the water of sin, we are nevertheless laying the foundation of our bridge on solid rock, and we are making progress toward our goal. Our victory is certain. The devil and all his servants will be put out of the habitable universe of God. There will be a new heaven and a new earth on which righteousness will dwell. End quote. Because of this foundation, true Christian faith has an ethics of hope and involves not only striving but possessing. The absolute ideal is presented in severity as the Old Testament itself witnesses and such concessions as that era witnessed did not compromise the absoluteness of the ideal or its severity. Such concessions as the Old Testament evidences are made, not in terms of the ultimate goal, but in terms of more immediate goals which are in themselves stepping stones to the ideal. The absoluteness of the goal is more openly set forth in the New Testament by means of the example of Jesus Christ. I'm a bit breathless, I don't know what that's about. Hmm. In order to understand the full meaning of his example, it is necessary to believe that origin does affect validity, that a Christ coming from the background of the self-contained God and ontological trinity is different from one born out of an evolutionary process and a background in which evil is as basic as the good. First, therefore, creation must be pre-proposed. Creation must be presupposed in all its implications. Quote, if the perfect man Jesus is to be any service to us, the constitution of the universe must be such that perfection is a concept that has cosmic significance. End quote. Second, to be valid, the example of Jesus presupposes the fall. This means that, because we were created righteous, we have an obligation to be perfect and are responsible for our present evil estate. We must either be like Jesus or be condemned by him. He comes as saviour or is met as judge. Third, 
The example of Jesus in the true Christian sense presupposes his substitutionary atonement, the acquired perfection is made a gift by God, and is man's, in principle, unregeneration. Our imitation of Christ must be properly conceived as an imitation of God, a union with him. But this union can never be conceived of in mystical or metaphysical terms. It is a union of life, not of substance, ethical, not essential. It is typified in Scripture as marriage. True marriage is true union, not of substance, but of life. The man does not cease to be man, nor the woman a woman, but each fulfills himself in terms of sex and life and becomes more himself or herself while more truly one. Thus, man becomes more fully man as he becomes more truly one with Christ. Christ, as our example, is thus primarily Christ as our mediator and redeemer. And Christ as our king means that the kingship of Christ must be carried out in every sphere of life, For the church to limit herself to soul-saving is to deny his kingship over all creation and to limit the crown rights of king... and to limit the crown rights of King Jesus. As Van Til points out, evangelical churches have too commonly fallen into an anti-biblical individualism in their exclusive concern with soul-saving, while modernism in abandoning the substitutionary atonement, has returned to the righteousness of the Pharisees and seeks to establish the kingdom by man's effort and man's righteousness and is, consequently, man-centred in its conception of the kingdom. Quote, The whole end and purpose of history lies, according to Christian theism, not in history itself, but beyond history, in the God of history. This God of history has set the kingdom of God as the climax of his history. <laughs> has set the kingdom of God as the climax of history. End quote. The revealed will of God must therefore be man's ethical standard. The moral consciousness of man as it is today only corroborates the idea of the fall of man. It assumes its authority and autonomy and denies that God is the creator. It denies, therefore, external revelation, since it cannot credit external authority. Quote, Christian theism, because of its transcendent God, can allow for external as well as internal revelation, while non-theistic thought, because of its denial of the transcendence of God, can, in the nature of the case, allow for no external standards at all. Non-Christian thought must, by virtue of its presuppositions, maintain that all external revelations are based on delusion. I feel weird. Uh, Why do I eat mince? Why do I do that to myself? All external revelations are based upon delusion, The rationale of man's moral action must be found in something beyond himself. In the nature of the case, the external must always be prior to the internal. Unless this external and divine ethical standard be maintained, there is moral anarchy. Without the God of Scripture, there is only ethical advice, no authority. Quote, There is no alternative but that of theonomy and autonomy. It is vain to attempt to flee from God and flee to a universe in order to seek eternal, eternal, that's a word, that is really a word, honestly, trust me. It's beautiful. Flee from God and flee to a universe in order to seek eternal, eternal. Why am I saying eternal? It is vain to attempt to flee from God and flee to a universe in order to seek eternal laws there. End quote. The external, absolute standard of the self-sufficient God is therefore the only valid one. 
While naturalistic ethics trust the immediate deliverances of man's moral consciousness, Christianity holds to the principle of mediacy in that man's moral consciousness is not expected to function autonomously but is correlative to supernatural positive revelation and, by the Holy Spirit, is led to increasing trust on that standard and activity is led to increasing trust on that standard and activity in terms of that faith. Such, in brief, is Van Til's conception of Christian theistic. In brief, he says. In brief, after forty-seven minutes. Such, in brief, is Van Til's conception of Christian theistic ethics. His study, which contains some of his most brilliant writing, is an eloquent answer to those who complain that Van Til is too difficult to understand. The difficulty most people experience is not with Van Til's writing, but with his God. It is essentially he whom they find unacceptable and offensive. Their quarrel is not with what they cannot understand in Van Til, but with that which they all too clearly understand. Well, I was uh, basically I've memorized that chapter and I understand everything. Lie detector. All right, why don't we have a go at the forward now? How's about that? For a crazy idea. Crazy. You're crazy, man. Crazy. All right, so let's do that. Can I take a little drink? Hope you're well. Hope it's all good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. All right. I'm going to keep that other one for the end. Forward. Basic to this study is the belief that the presuppositions of human thought in every field must be basically one in order to arrive at any concept which validates both biblical faith and human knowledge. The sovereignty of the self... No, no, no. Not good enough. In order to arrive at any concept which validates both biblical faith and human knowledge, the sovereignty of the self-contained God is the key to every field in that only the God of Scripture makes all things possible and explicable and is thus the basic premise not only of theology but of philosophy, science and indeed all knowledge. In that God is the creator of all things, he is their only valid principle of interpretation in that they derive both their existence and meaning from his creative act. This belief is herein set forth in terms of various aspects of human thought. Again, basic to this study is a belief that such a philosophy finds consistent and able exposition in the writings of Cornelius van Til. This work, therefore, is thus both an exposition of a philosophy and an exposition as well of van Til's development of that philosophy a school of thoughts to which this writer subscribes. R.J. Rushduni. Rushduni. Rushidushi. R.J. Rushduni. I know it doesn't say Rushduni, but... I mean, R.J.R., what, what are people going to think? What's that, R.J.R.? What I talk about, man. All right, so thanks very much for listening to my babbling. Um... If you want to help out, you can like and share the videos. You can tell your friends about it, if you want to lose your friends, probably. You can uh, also make a financial contribution by going to <gasps> nathanteacher.com and clicking on something, clicking like donate button. Or you can make a monthly or one-off donation. So thanks very much for sticking with me, and I hope to see you in the following chapters.